forks. What are they? Where do they come from? How are they made? What do they know? To Will I Vike It? I'm here today at the Ancient Technology Centre with my guest Tom Bainan, who is a blacksmith. Welcome, Tom. You're right there. Uh, Tom's come along today to talk a bit about what he does, um, and we've got a particular find that we're going to discuss as well. Um, we're going to eat some food together. So, how did you get started with blacksmithing? Uh, blacksmithing is something that I've was always kind of interested with from maybe about 16 years old. It's something that kind of was in the back of my mind. Oh, that might yeah. be interesting to do. Um, but it's largely after I went and did a history degree at Leicester University that I thought, you know what, I'll give it a go. Went on some night classes, absolutely loved it, and frankly from then it's just been, we've got to do that now. Yeah. So did that start off with sort of more modern blacksmithing or did you go straight for the historical? Uh, yeah, it was, um, we're trained as, uh, if, you, if you learn blacksmithing at college, you're largely trained as an artist blacksmith, um, whether that's architectural, so making things like uh, stairways, gates, fences and the likes or whether it's um, fine scale sculpture or even larger sculptures so that's mostly where uh, college training came in yeah. and I operated as an artist blacksmith for about uh, five, six, seven years um, over the last five years or so though I've been starting to switch towards bladesmithing instead and focusing um, largely on actually smaller knives and cutlery Okay do you have um, a particular period that you prefer to recreate? Because I know that you make all sorts of things from your Iron Age right through Roman and even up to the Tudor period, right? So, uh, it, I've got to say, it largely depends on how much of a challenge I'm fancying taking on. Yeah. Um, as it's not to say early knives are complex, but there's some in incredible ones that, on the whole, don't require anything beyond uh, the typical skills that I've learned as a blacksmith. Um, when you get to places like the 17th century, some of these knives uh, and forks and pieces of cutlery become more akin to jewellery. Right. Um, in laying mother of pearl squares into a sort of chessboard pattern, yeah. in black horn handles, gold leafing, silver wire inlay. Uh, those are all skills that I've had to kind of learn and pick up over the years. Um, mm. So if I'm feeling ambitious, that's the place to go to the 17th century. The 17th century would be your choice. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to um, tuck into a, some food um, and we're going to show you a particular find that I asked Tom to make for me. Um, probably a couple of years back now. I think. Yeah, I think it's maybe three. three so I've had, so. had a bit of a chance to actually use it at some shows and events and demonstrate it to people. So I've got my own opinions about it. But we've got here this Anglo-Saxon fork, which I will demonstrate for you there. Yeah, this little fork here. So it's the uh, Severington Horde, isn't it? If I remember correctly. Yeah, Severington yeah, in Wiltshire, because I Wiltshire. believe in the Mead Hall book it says it's Hampshire or somewhere, but I believe that's wrong. Yeah, I, it's, it's certainly one that has uh, cropped up a few times in uh, the books in, in the British Museum as well. And no one can quite determine whether Severington's meant to be in Hampshire or Wiltshire. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Wiltshire. Um, yeah, it's, uh, the original's actually um, silver, um, but we didn't have the material at the time to go that extreme. I think it was or, budget for me as well, to be honest. <laughs> it was, uh... Yeah, it, it makes a big difference, the, the materials. Yeah. So instead, I've made this one out of uh, bronze. Um, and it's for something that's quite small and delicate, it's actually a... a fairly complex item to make um, because it's so many individual pieces we're talking one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen individual pieces that are created separately and then joined together at key points with soldering and um, this one in its dimensions is bang on it's just lacking a lot of the decoration that the original has um, the terminals along the uh, the handle well, actually, some of them were actually carved to be little animal heads, but actually getting that image, that closer detail on it, it's, oh, um, small, yeah. yeah, I yeah. think some are maybe snakes, some might be a dog, it's, it's really hard to kind of determine on it, um, but it's just one of those finds that's a little bit of an oddity. We have double-ended 
uh, or supposed double-ended items, uh, mostly spoons from uh, Jorvik is, uh, early medieval York is the uh, main place that springs to mind, where you have these spatula ends at both sides. And some are quite flat and others seem to be quite bold. Uh, in the Severington Hall, there's actually a second find as well within it, again with a more spatula end and one that's got more of a recess for a bowl in it. And the question is, what were they used for? That is a good question, which is what we're going to try and experiment today with our food. So I've brought along a few things for Tom to try the fork out on. Um, so we've got some venison tenderloin that's just been fried in butter. We've got some hearts cooked with um, some bacon, uh, onions, cream, kale, um, and then we've just got some fruit that's been stewed in wine and honey, which is more of a, it's my take on really bad Saxon wine. The Saxon wine was known to be quite dry because of the grapes that were growing here at the time, and if you couldn't afford to import the good stuff, you'd flavour it sometimes with things like fennel. <coughs> right. It makes quite a pleasant brew. Um, just to you know drink but it's mainly about preserving the fruit we did this back in the summer and we found the fruits were still perfectly edible about two weeks on they hadn't lost any of like the firmness or anything like oh, that right. so it works for preserving the fruit it doubles up as a nice tasting wine at the end as well all I can think is it looks like I'm about to be spoiled with all the fruit <laughs> frankly um, yeah it's it's I mean the food itself I mean the reasonings behind doing these foods uh, is because I mean it's how we think maybe a fork could potentially be used it's it's typically thought that of course forks didn't even uh, for many say I've come across books where they said forks didn't even exist until like the 1400s unless you were over uh, more in the Middle East yeah but it's yeah. something that keeps popping up again and again and whether this fork was used for eating maybe it was used for um, uh, taking food out of service dishes or so, some cases the spoon ends the spatula ends have been described as potentially for thick treacly foods or even measuring out spices so this is a good selection of food to be able to actually uh, test out certain theories yeah and see whether we think one is more likely than the other or whether it's possible that we we'll use it for all of them I mean, they, they certainly weren't common in the period were they I mean we've got a handful of, of finds from Saxon England. That's it. I mean, definitely not a definitely not a common item. A very rare item, in fact. Um, I only know of one other that's uh, been found um, in Britain, and it's quite a suspect find. We were just talking about it earlier. It's yeah. from 900 AD, apparently in Yorkshire, but the style of it is so modern in that it's three timed. There's certain aspects about it which do make it seem more ancient. However. Uh, it, it's without further information on where it was found and uh, the actual excavation of it. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit suspect. Um, uh, but what we've got to appreciate is we have people like the Romans before. They definitely had forks within their uh, society. Um, I don't know of any that have been found in Britain. There may have been a couple. I'm not too sure. Um, but then we also have uh, references to forks being used by select individuals in Europe uh, and it causing an utter stir it just shows how yeah. kind of uh, individual or, or special they were um, of a princess marrying it's either I think we were saying it's been referenced twice there's two references I don't know if it's supposed to be the same princess but there are two references to princesses marrying uh, someone in Rome was it I think I've heard one is a Venetian Duke another is someone yeah. from the Holy Roman Empire um, and yeah, they're all talking and exclaim of how, uh, in one case, someone was saying she was so delicate or others saying she was so vain that yeah. she didn't use her hand or a spoon to eat with, but she conveyed food to her mouth with a golden fork, um, which, uh, again, we have a manuscript from about a thousand AD um, depicting two men sitting at a table eating and using forks to bring food to their mouth. Um, and the style of forks very similar, not too far removed from this in its shape and style yeah. either. It's a bit yeah. more Byzantine in how theirs look, but it's not too removed from this. So do you know, is that quite similar to the style they were using in Byzantine? Um, there's a wide range of them. Um, generally, they are actually seem to be cast in bronze or silver. Um, and 
what we've probably got to appreciate is the forks were generally seem to be high status items um, with lots of decoration. Sometimes the heads, their shaping gets a little bit ridiculous on some of them. Um, but I've known many things that aren't where a fashion or, or prettiness gives way to practicality. Um, but there are a lot that seem to be quite delicate and mm. gentle um, eating implements. So whether someone from Saxon, England was looking across sort of with rose tinted glasses at the Roman Empire and, and you know, trying to sort of join in with what they were doing. I mean, if we could be talking about someone who's had influence from uh, yeah, the, the diminished Roman Empire, from, uh, from maybe someone who's travelled across from the Byzantine Empire or been over there um, and had that influence upon them. They've seen it. They thought, hey, I like these. These, make, these are quite interesting. Uh, it, it's just one of those things. It's almost impossible to say. Yeah. Um, I like the idea that perhaps these were used for either um, some spices or high volume items, maybe, maybe as measuring tools or maybe as selecting them. Um, it could have been you you eat with one end and you've got a clean end to operate with, especially with double-sided spoons. Yeah. Um, the, the, we've got to also appreciate that when we're talking about eating with forks, we're not talking about eating in the same way we do today. Um, it's not about shoveling food in uh, or putting the whole item in your mouth. Um, these forks generally are quite pointed, quite sharp on the tips. So when we do see them appearing uh, slightly more frequently in uh, Western Europe, they're, again, not being put directly into the mouth. You are selecting food. You've got it in your bowl or your dish. You are picking up the food. It might be something that's very sticky, so you can't eat with your fingers or your spoon easily but you're selecting the piece, you're bringing it to your mouth, you actually bite the food off the fork. You don't put the whole fork in. Very bad manners to do so. Yeah, okay. And if you're sitting at a board with multiple people around you and someone nudges you... Pats you on the back. That's it, <laughs> absolutely. Very yeah. pointy thing in your face. Yeah. You know, two extra breathing holes. <laughs> uh, but again, yeah, it's... Um, an another aspect which hopefully will... Well, which we are going to test today is the use of this as potentially a carving or a service item as well. So potentially holding meat while it's carved or keeping it steady. Well, it could shall be, we give it a go and find out? I think we're going to have to give it a go. That's the only we? way to decide. Wonderful. Okay, so which do you think we should... Uh, what theory do you think we should go with first, do you think? I think if we start with the carving... Okay. Um, and I think you're going to demonstrate to me how you should properly carve. <laughs> well, I'm going to try you, to demonstrate. You did tell me that people don't <laughs> carve correctly, so Tom's going to show us how you should be carving. Um, so we'll do that, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll tuck into some venison and uh, maybe move on to the hearts and maybe the fruit for pudding. Absolutely. That's, that sounds more sense think, to me. Yeah. To be honest, the experiment's secondary. We're just uh, going to enjoy the food, aren't we? That's sure. it. Yeah. So we've got our uh, little venison loin here. Uh, um, I've just brought over a 17th century fork here just because it's something we've uh, a little bit more recognizable for carving. Um, generally, most people, especially when they come to the Sunday roast, will ram the fork in and start to try and carve slices of meat. Um, it's not actually the technique you want to be used, doing because one, there's the risk that you end up hitting the fork, but actually it, uh, it basically breaks apart the grain of the meat. You want that to kind of have a bit of resistance in it. It's also why it's so important to let the meat rest because if you start cutting this when it is fresh out of the oven, fresh off the fire, all the fat inside it is so liquid, everything's so soft, the whole piece of meat will start rolling about and stopping you, stop you from cutting it. So the, really the technique we're wanting to be using is you're actually wanting to bring your fork and press down and you're just holding it in place. You're trying to do this with as little, uh, as few cuts back and forwards as possible. This is where I'm gonna find out if I've sharpened this knife <laughs> well enough today or not. Um, if we were doing it with medieval techniques, you would actually even only hold your carving knife with your first two fingers and your thumb, kind of like holding it like a scalpel. And ideally, you'd be trying to do this in as few cuts as possible as he does that quite badly, and just running through. Ooh, it's quite tough at the bottom there. And cutting just something quite 
clean without all these serration lines in. So that's using it with something that we know could be used quite nicely for it. So the next question is using something like this fork. And our worry is that it will be too delicate. In my experience, I've done it wrong because I've stabbed it in. You've stabbed it in. Ah. Maybe that's where I've been going wrong. And actually, you're now going to prove that it could be used. So if, if we just hold that in place, I'm f I am finding when the mate's getting a little bit tough at the bottom there, I'm finding that it's too weak in the central line uh, where my finger is on the fork. It yeah, is I'm bowing it. I'm having to put too much pressure on it. Yeah. So potentially, we could talk about coming to uh, right at the base here. Let's put them in a bit more. Right at the base here. That's a bit better. Again, we're hitting that last tough bit. It's hard when really I'm actually looking at the fork and not the bit that I'm actually carving. That's not too bad. Not the clean as the carving, I've got to say. Um, the the big challenge on that is yet yeah, the we can see that the fork itself is actually quite thin um, we could make that tougher than probably that section is um, it's not been hardened in any way by hammering um, the tines are holding up lovely they're not bending at all but the big issue is it's nice having these specialist bits of equipment but actually you can um, do the same thing in fact with two knives if I can take another piece of um, uh, venison there we can do the same thing again you don't need a fork for it you can use a second knife to hold in place while we uh, cut through the lovely bit of venison there and I'm not finding that particularly difficult now let's have a bit more finesse in this and go even thinner and I guess it actually makes sense not to stab your piece of meat because you're not ruining any sections that's it absolutely yeah. and you can see we're just, I'm now serrating a bit. That's quite bad technique. That's me getting a little bit lazy. Um, but again, we're just adding that little bit of pressure um, to it as we cut. Tricky on the last piece. Yeah. So again, that fork, finding it just that little bit too delicate for, for that process. Um, again, we could toughen up that section. Uh, but the the main question is then potentially is it a service piece? Would we maybe use that instead to remove meat from the uh, service board or from what's been carved and bring it to your dish? Um, because contrary to what a lot of people tend to think is there were definitely manners right, okay. in Anglo-Saxon England, um, especially post-Christianization. Yeah. Um, but for high status uh, boards, high status uh, tables, where something like this potentially would make an appearance, um, those manners would be quite important as well. So we're gonna test the theory first that this is a serving fork. Um, so would you like to be my I'll be your, I'll be your server, <laughs> I will, I will. So you can we, serve me some we've got your bowl tasty here. venison. Here we go. we'll make a bit of space for this, I think. Yeah, so. Of course, we've now carved the meat. We've had a look at all of that. Potentially, it's a serving fork. Um, you know, later periods, you'd be talking about how meat was cut to fair size gobbets, so pieces that would fit your mouth, okay, essentially, gobbet. so that when you're sitting down and eating, you're not actually having to cut up your food. It's already cut for you. Um, that seems a bit lazy. <laughs> it seems a bit lazy, but that's, yeah. that's hopefully the idea. So, yeah. uh, potentially, as a service, or if, if you're at a mm -hmm. smaller, you're most welcome, if you're at a smaller table um, or, or a mess of four people, um, only the head table in higher households, later periods we're talking about here, only the head table would actually have the master carver, the mm. panter, the cup bearer, all of that going on. For any of the lower tables, sometimes they were split into fours um, and you would have two people of higher status, two people of lower status and the lower would be expected to carve and serve for the higher yeah and then they would turn to each other sort out who's serve the highest and serve each other right, okay. basically so yeah. it, it it's all a um all a sort of actor uh, a, a kind of theater a drama that's going on between them all that these people would have rehearsed from a young age you'd be a cupbearer in later periods when you're much younger i've heard for saxons that mm. um in some manuscripts they're talking about uh, women not being allowed at these meals 
except in some uh, unless they were of certain status. But the only women that might be present, they're actually working, serving as cupbearers right, instead. Okay. Um, of course, that's just someone else's opinion. Yeah, and it's something to look in deeper. As a lot of it say. Is. Yeah, that's it. Absolutely. We one thing that seems to be constant amongst um, manners and how people eat is that different households do seem to have different ways. So, as a service fork, it works perfectly well. That foot works perfectly well to me. Um, Certainly after Christianization, I can't say for the Saxons whether they had the left and right hand separation for taking food, where you are allowed to eat with your right hand, that's allowed to come to your mouth, yeah. but your left hand never goes to your mouth. Instead, you can use your left hand to take food out of service dishes. Right, okay. Um, I've heard of that more in sort of Eastern to sort of... Tradition. Eastern, I mean, Tudor, um, definitely yeah. there. We have things like the, um, uh, the Book of Carving, um, a text written by... An, ex-servant who talks about all these things to try and create some form of manual for future servants to learn in households how, how it's meant to be done. Right. Um, so, you know, potentially there is, we're taking food with our hands, but something like this venison done in this lovely butter with all the juices around, um, I might want to leave that hand unsoiled. Sure. So a service fork would be ideal for that. Okay. So we could next demonstrate whether you think it would have also been used as an eating utensil. So I'm going to let That's you... Listen, you're going to let me do that. Let you do that bit. I'm going to use my fingers, I think. <laughs> Obviously, I'm high status, you're surely. You're much That's higher status than me. You're you from know. the future. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Whether we use that, we just have the tines. It's kind of like teaching people to suck eggs. But as I said, it's not going straight into the mouth. You are just and gently taking it off, it off the end. Um, you're not ramming that straight into your mouth. And again, everything cut into fair size gobbets. It does just go straight in. Straight in. Perfect. No problem. It was a sign of gluttony. We do have some Saxon feasts written about, and it is a sign of gluttony to be over eager with eating, to put too large a piece in your mouth in one go. You sh it should be small and not too frequent. Same with drinking, I'm sorry guys. But it's meant to be small sips and not too frequently. Um, otherwise, uh, you are c committing gluttony, the sin of gluttony. The only thing I will comment on with this particular dish, this is actually... Oh, I should finish my mouthful before I talk. Bad manners. It's because I don't have a fork. Um, so this is actually a fallow deer, because at the time when I, I needed one for a butchery course, um, I couldn't get hold of a roe deer. So they wouldn't have had fallow. Fallow d actually disappeared during the Saxon period, which I find quite interesting in itself. Mm -hmm. The Romans brought fallow over, they disappear for the Saxons, and then the Normans bring them over. And they know that because of the DNA. Oh, right, okay. Um, I couldn't, don't quote me on this, but one is from the east and one is from the west. And from the DNA of the deer, they can tell that the ones that came later were a different from a different okay. batch. So yeah. Other all than I can that, say, it tastes lovely. That's all I can say. <laughs> It certainly works mm. with a fork. I've got to say, I wouldn't feel out of place using that um, at a banquet, high status banquet, um, wanting to show that level of manners. Do you think uh, um, you'd be the only one using it and would people then be commenting on this? I mean, well, we certainly know they did in <laughs> certain social circles. Um, again, it, it's, it's one of these bits that we just couldn't know. It's purely, I mean, the rarity of the find. Mm. Uh, in the in the Severington, Severington Horde, there was also a. Was there any other eating implements? I can't quite remember. Was there a frying pan or something else? It might have been a bunch of coins. No. Or anything. Um, there might have been a spoon, maybe. Um, yeah, a spoon. That was it as well. Yeah. So potentially, you've got your spoon. You've got your fork. Potentially, you've got the second ends. Now I've eaten with that. Yeah. As, although it hasn't been in my mouth. Um, generally things that go into the mouth that's very personal that's where the hygiene is that's where people don't want to share stuff sure. um, in theory that should be should be clean enough I would most likely wipe it on a, uh, a some cloth or something before but I do now have the second side so I could switch and cleanly 
Stay take sure. food. If you wanted some more. You know. Um, yeah. Only a theory, though. So as there's not many of them, we can assume that they weren't a table full of people using forks, at least. We, cer we certainly don't see them appearing on um, any woodcuts or manuscripts from uh, Saxon, Western Europe, uh, anywhere like that. Um, but then sometimes we've always got to be aware of taking these things too literally as well. You know, uh, if we look at the manuscripts, you see one knife. Does that mean there was one knife between an entire table of revelers? You know, yeah. the, the boats that bring the Norman soldiers over for the uh, Battle of Hastings on the Bay, Bay Tapestry. There's only four guys in a boat. Does that mean their boats could only carry four guys? It's, it's, it's my issue of manuscripts. We've always got to take them with that pinch of, yourself. you can't expect it to reflect exact reality. Sure. Um, so maybe some did. They're certainly an incredibly rare find. Well, as I'm based in Wiltshire, and as I'm uh, a Wiltshire Saxon, I think I can get away. I'm just about high enough status <laughs> that I could get away if I wanted to, as to using that at a feast. Um, but shall we try some of the heart next? Absolutely. Um, I guess we could see whether that fares just as well with uh, using it as a serving implement. If, if you do not mind, I would do. I mean, it's a lovely big piece of heart. I mean, that's cooked lovely, and that is not, as I say, the tines of the fork hold up beautifully. And that is not um, causing any issue. I'm not finding that it's deforming or struggling with anything at all. And we have the smaller bits and pieces down here. Potentially we can be adding, um, I'd ideally want a larger service spoon than that. I think you would for, doesn't really work so well for this dish, does it? Which is, uh, so it's hearts with kale, onions, uh, bacon, lardons, um, yeah. cream. Did I say mushrooms? God. <laughs> <laughs> But then this spoon, unlike the other one, the, the spatula end on this, unlike the other one found in the grave, doesn't have any bowling to it. Mm. It's just, it is just a spatula. Uh, so I guess we've got to make the second one now, don't we? And test that one out. Make, <laughs> make the second one. The silver one, one that we've talked about. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be using that for this kind of service here, no. No, so perfectly well for the venison, not so well for a more sort of mixed bowl dish. Um, I'm going to grab a spoon for this, I think. Fingers. I've also made the terrible error of making the pieces too big to now just put it in my mouth. Too so right. I've, got, I've got a big gob, so it's okay. I think what I'm going to need to do is borrow the knife. So there's a, a lesson for me there today, is I need to start cutting my meat into smaller chunks before I serve it. I don't want to seem too barbaric, do you? <laughs> you know. I'm very civilised. Are you a fan of the offal, the heart? I will eat everything. The only thing I've never been overly keen on is liver. Um, and that's not for want of trying. Mm. People have assured me if it's cooked properly, it's, it's really nice. I don't know, there's just a taste to it that just, just doesn't sit with me. It's a than a heart, yeah. isn't it? I mean, heart is... A mellower flavour. Mm. I, I never had an issue with kidneys too until I did a full in-depth biology lesson on what they were for and how they operated. And it's still, I don't mind eating them, but when I cut one open and look inside, I go, ah, yeah, that's where that is and so mm. on and so forth. And that's why it tastes like it does. Uh, it, it's only slightly off-putting. I'm not for a me, squeamish person by nature. For me, with kidneys, it's the smell. Mm. I can't get over the smell. I've tried cooking them, and the, the smell just puts me right off eating them. Give me, give me heart any day, though. That's uh, that's lovely. I've got to say, that's nicely cooked as well. It's uh, not too chewy. Sometimes they can be a bit chewy, can't they, with the yes. valves and things? But if you get it just right, it wasn't cooked for very long. It's more of a flash fry, so it's nice and tender. Feels like we should do a banquet with full dinner service now, I think. <laughs> Maybe that's one we'll speak to Andy about and host a feast in the long haul. Only one pork, though. Unless you want to make enough for a, a whole party. Yeah, I don't mind, I don't mind. <laughs> if you pay me, I'll do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so what I will do, I'm going to quickly grab us a couple more bowls. Um, for our pudding because I don't really think we want to be mixing heart and cream with 
some fruit? Well, people would be eating out of one bowl largely. I mean, that's mm. why a slice of bread comes in handy. You can clean out your bowl. But I mean, having things like uh, pork, perhaps roast pork at a feast, and then someone brings stewed apple out, mm. all you're having is basically your pork and apple sauce together. Sure. Um, and again, for later periods, we know that you'd have removed, say, bring all the food out, remove away and bring whole sets, but you have desserts and uh, what we could savory or serve together. And no one would judge you if you mixed them all together and ate them, as long as you just don't take too much. <laughs> I believe there are some dishes as well, some evidence of dishes. We don't have a lot from the Saxon period, but um, of sort of fruits and things being added to stews. So we've done things like damson and beef stew. Mm. So with certain pairings, yes, you could get away with it potentially. And we've got the cream because it's in the hearts. So. Yeah. If you're happy with the same bowl. I'm happy with the same bowl. bowl. Do we have a cloth? I'll clean that before t testing yeah. this out for service on the uh, stewed fruits, I think. Yeah. Let's use that one, I think. Wonderful. So I'm pr pretty certain this isn't going to work as the spatula end. We can try it and find out <laughs> what happens. So, I've already explained exactly sort of what the process was or why I've sort of come up with this dish. Mm. I know there are later, I think it might be 16th century, evidence of them using fork for dishes like this because it's fruit in a syrup. It's too messy for your hands. So you'd use your fork with the spoon end to sort of finish the syrup, or in this case, wine. Mm. Um, yeah, we can give it a go. We'll, we'll see how, how suspended these are, but uh, it's... It could uh, be uh, an interesting... It's uh, a bit like... Strawberry bobbing at the moment. This is. <laughs> but, so uh, strawberries, blueberries, and raspberries, which it looks as if the raspberries have sunk. The blueberries and strawberries are floating. <laughs> <laughs> this is where it is getting difficult. Yeah. So uh, you're having a bit of difficulty with the fork end. Yeah. There you we go. See, one. there we go. We lost one. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm blaming the service dish, not the, uh, not the. Uh, <laughs> here you go. If you come closer with that. There you go. You can have a blueberry. Love it. <laughs> I'm not going to try and get another one out there. <laughs> you want to try the uh, spoon end? Maybe you can... I'll see uh, if I can get the spoon end there. Whether it works or not. Again, we're, I would it's a bit serve tricky. this in a, uh, a wider bowl, similar to the um, what the lamb was in. Yeah, that's a bit tricky. But again, talking about it, I mean, spiced, some form of wine and your uh, fruits, maybe even... Oh, it's going a bit more Roman, I guess. I'm not too sure on the Saxon food. You're the expert there. But stewed or boiled in some form of wine, um, whether they then end up reduced as a compote um, or taken even further so it becomes more uh, treacly, the sugars in the wine potentially uh, car caramelized. Uh, something that, again, you wouldn't want to be putting your hand in for service dish. Um, you'd pick out potentially the individual fruits. I'm thinking more along the lines of 16th century um, yeah. uh, sweet suckets, um, ca uh, not caramelized, candied fruit peel yeah. in syrup uh, using very delicate forks. That's where we start to see forks appearing in, um, in England being used. Uh, they're more of a thing in Italy and on the continent, but by the time we get to the 16th, late 16th century, forks are appearing at at boards, mostly at sugar banquets, in fact. Um, it's not so much then that the fork is expensive, it's the food you eat it is expensive. The food you use the fork to eat is expensive. So people might have forks, but they might ever never get to use them if they're never invented, invited to a sugar banquet. Right, okay. So these are relatively freshly stewed. These were done yesterday. As I said, we have done it and left them for a couple of weeks and they've remained intact. To be honest, I feel like I could eat through a banquet with this and not feel like a, uh, well, not feel unrefined. <laughs> <laughs> eating with this and you eating with a spoon there, I just certainly feel like I- Elevated. Elevated, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I, I feel special. I get, I get what, uh, was it the Pope saying that uh, the lady eating with a fork, you said she- I think it was the Pope at the time. I could can't tell you the name of them um, but yes you're right they uh, she later died of the plague and this was years later um, and the Pope did say that it was because of her vanity because she'd been seen at a banquet eating with a fork so if you get the plague it's because you use forks well I get COVID now after that is that's gonna happen it's my vanity from the fork is 
You've jinxed yourself. I've jinxed myself, no. that's it, you hasn't don't it? mention the little <laughs> Right, so from that, so we've had our three dishes. So do you think there's any conclusions we can make from its use based on... I mean, it's, again, it it's, can only be a, th- a working theory. I'm not against them being used at a dinner board, at a table, as long as you recognise very rare kind of item. Um, but also appreciate that something like that is has a more normal status over in places like the Byzantine Empire. So I always caution people who like to uh, portray um, uh, P- uh, Vikings or Scandinavians who maybe have uh, got equipment or have been over to the Byzantine Empire and come back to Britain. There's potential that they could have also brought back certain fashions. I mean, it's not just the baggy trousers that they yeah. might have picked up. <laughs> eating habits as well, styles of cutlery, you might have had people using that, uh, these items. Again, we've got the spoons in uh, Jorvik. I'm still happy with the idea that they were used for measuring, for, for dividing out perhaps expensive spices and the likes, uh, perhaps pepper and so on and so forth, or weighing out as, as yeah. a measurement stick. Um, but none of them have a fork on the end. So this that's what makes this one so it's unique unique and so yeah. separate to it. Yeah. Um, typologically, it's very similar, but none of the others, their remains don't show a fork on the end. Uh, and certainly there are metal double-ended spoons that are double-sided, but the spoon seems big enough and bold enough that it's more along the lines of what we would think as eating with... The spatula ends typically thought it can't be used to eat a soup. Um, a very slight bowling on that, um, and you're not far off some Roman spoons. It's and some 17th century, even though they're quite large, they're quite wide. Sorry, F- a fair lot of them are hardly bowled at all, and you can eat. I've done it for seven yeah. years, eight years on a Tudor farm. You can eat potted, you can eat stew with that. You've just got to kind of change that image of what you're thinking eating with it is and that you're meant to be doing it in small amounts. You're not meant to be shoveling the food into your mouth. You are meant to be doing it, especially at the higher tables, in a more delicate, more demure way um, and showing you have some semblance of culture and manner about you. And that you're enjoying the food. <laughs> and that you're enjoying eating. the food, yeah, so that's it. It kind of has a respect to the food. You're not wafting it down and leaving again. That's you're it. taking your time, probably having a conversation as we are now. Mm. Uh, yeah. And the, the, the meal itself might go on for a long time. So you don't need to eat it all in one go. And there might be other dishes brought to you as well. So you're not finishing a whole bowl of lamb heart. You're having some lamb heart, some venison, some what have you. And you're taking bits and pieces of and sampling lots of different things instead of eating vast quantities of two uh, ingredients. You know. Kind of reminds you of the modern chefs where you get this tiny little portion on your yeah. plate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> look at it, is that it? You know. That's it. Nothing's new. Mm. Did it already. Yeah. So uh, I've got a few questions just to kind of close out with really. Um, so one of them was if you had an unlimited budget, mm-hmm. is there a particular thing that you'd like to make? Oh, there's a, there's a, uh, <laughs> not so much a, it's, it's not a one item, it's a, uh, a multiple item. I one of the things I'd very much like to work on is a full uh, 17th century dinner service set. Um, you do get them sometimes where you have apostle spoons um, and then uh, the corresponding fork and knife as well to go with that apostle. Yeah. So uh, and then they those come in entire huge canteens with all of that, so you could open that out and uh, people would. Um, would go for that and pick out a particular apostle, would have that a cutlery for the meal. Um, but uh, some of the carving trousses as well, uh, there's a particular one in the uh, Leeds Armouries, um, 17th century again, uh, it's a hunting trousse, but it's a huge cleaver, it's got a couple of knives, it's got a, um, a file and a skewer and a steel basically in one tool. Um, also accompanying with that though, that trousse, there is also a um, hunting sword and what they call a forester's sword that has a serrated back edge to it as well for sawing 
wood, apparently. Okay. But that entire set is one set. Wow. Um, whether it would be the Trisse and the Forester sword is carried by the Lord's servants and yeah. he carries the sword, whatever it does. To me, though, it's the whole ensemble. It's the whole matched set, the same pattern, same things. That cool. would be pretty fun and awesome to do so if someone out there wants to commission <laughs> tom to make that piece you'll uh, make his dreams come true yes yeah um right so um sort of bringing it back to food again last just a couple of closing questions is do you think you could survive on a saxon or viking diet uh i think i could um I very happily it's it's a it's a way of eating that lends itself to a natural rhythm of work. Um, personally, my preference is the Iron Age. <laughs> um, and the diet itself doesn't change too much from uh, the Saxon diet. Uh, for about eight years of my life working on a Tudor farm, my main meal of each day was a tu Elizabethan Tudor yeah. a farm house meal. Uh, and it's, although we don't eat in any way the amount of calories that they were eating at that meal, because we're not working anywhere near as hard as they were then working, you know, 5,000 calories, four to 5,000 calories wow. a day, yeah. just to maintain your body weight wow. as a day laborer on a farm, That's you know, hard. or a craftsman, you're working an hour after sunrise, potentially to an hour before sunset, well, you know, those kind of variances with about a two hour gap in the middle of that at midday for your main meal. These kind of, this kind of food, uh, incredible decrease in the amount of sugar, um, uh, it's certainly much happier whenever I've switched to Saxon, yeah. Iron Age, Tudor diets and tried them for extended periods. I'm much happier after eating them. I like the idea of drinking eight pints of ale a day as well. Not, <laughs> not, not strong ale, but that being your main the drink. Beer. The week beer. The week beer, the week yeah. ale yeah. as your main drink. I think we should kind of bring that back a little <laughs> bit more, maybe. Is it so sort of tied into that question that is... Is there anything that you think you'd miss? So if we could take you to the Viking Age and eat Viking Age food, is there a food stuff they didn't have that you think you'd struggle to live with? Oh, there's... Uh, after every event, after every uh, time, I'd restrict myself to historic food. There is always two items that I immediately have when I get back home. Uh, yeah. It's coffee and a Mars bar. Coffee and a Mars bar. <laughs> that does it for me. Then I'm back in the 21st century. <laughs> but you see how quickly it drops off the end of health. <laughs> so, um, refined sugar. Yeah, yeah, lovely. Okay. But I can do without it. Brilliant. Well, thank you for coming on. Um, where can people find you online? Uh, so you can find me. Uh, I have a website, Facebook and Instagram. But it's all found as a big Bainance blacksmithing or bbblacksmithing.co.uk or find that on Facebook as well. Perfect. Well, thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye.